Hello and welcome to the fourth and final week of September RSA. I can't believe we've managed to make it all the way here to the last week of this conference. So it's a huge conference. As I said, there's been more than 340 tickets, I think, sent out. Very large community of people. And just as a reminder, it applies to the final week as much as it applied to all of the other weeks. We do have a code of conduct. Please act professionally, treat each other well. And everything is written down in the code of conduct link, which I've posted here. And it does apply at all times for all sessions on all platforms that are running for this conference. And of course, don't just be professional at the conference. When we finish, be professional in your normal lives as well. So getting in touch with us, um, I say this every week, but just as a reminder, if you have anything you want to ask us, please email us at conference2021 at societyrc.org. We have the conference information system. Um, if you go onto that and click on the contact page, you'll see all of the other contact links, including a way to send us anonymous messages if you wished. You can go to the September RSE booth in the virtual conference center, and you can find there a link to post messages and to send feedback. And again, there is a feedback form, which I'll go into in more detail when we get to the end of this talk, which please definitely this week do fill that in. So we are running the Oracle Cryptic Code treasure hunt. Uh, that's been a lot of fun this morning. Um, the final set of coins were added to the board. And uh, this is where I discovered how clever and circuitous and um, generally ingenious many of you are in that uh, there are some teams, and I, I applaud the ingenuity, who were not really following the spirit of the treasure hunt. Um, and so they were brute force decrypting or like various encryption attacks on the keys or doing things like looking up the keys in JavaScript from the map and just getting them that way without searching for them. That's very clever. I will post a shadow leaderboard of who got the keys first using circuitous methods, but um, the real prize, which is a small prize, um, I'm going to reserve for the person or team who actually did the treasure hunt, you know, in the way that it was intended. So that's basically walked across the board, found the coins by looking at the clues and also decrypting the coins using the methods which were given to you on the board. So this means talking to the various people like Dr. Note and Snowball and getting all of the various sub keys. And I will be asking the person who looks like they're the winner just to take me through how they they won or how they basically decoded it just to make sure you, you kind of did it in the way that it was intended um, otherwise it's it is then if it's, you don't do it that way then it's basically it's an exercise in looking up javascript and just running it through a decryption algorithm which isn't really what the treasure hunt was intended for and i do know there are people who are running across the board and collecting the coins and you know if you did decrypt things that way please do run across the board and find the coins that, that, that's also another way of doing it and if you haven't taken part in the treasure hunt so far so far the all 20 coins are still there. Do you have a go? It is a lot of fun. And, you know, even the people who do this securitously, they had a lot of fun doing it. And I do appreciate and applaud the various backdoor ways of doing it. And indeed, I think that, uh, as someone mentioned on Slack, there probably is a blog post in all of the different and weird and wonderful ways that people did this treasure hunt. I think it's a testament to the RSC community how, how varied the various routes people have sort of tackled this with. But anyway, more information is on the Oracle Crypto Code Treasure Hunt page. And as I said, I will be checking with whoever identified the winner that you have actually decoded the keys and you've done all the parts in the way that it was intended um, rather than a via a side channel route. Um, there's still time to buy conference merch. Indeed, I believe the merch will be online permanently. So if you miss out this week and haven't bought your sticker yet or your T-shirt, then of course you can always buy that um, sort of this week or after the conference. We have a lot of stuff going on this week, really full timetable as always. You can look it up by going onto the conference information system. As ever, we will be recording every single session and it will be on YouTube as soon as possible. And we will be running the summary talk. So this week's summary talk on Thursday. Remember we finished the conference on Thursday this week because that's the 30th of September. That summary talk on Thursday will be a summary of most of the conference, plus also a really nice chance for us to reflect on this month of RSC uh, and to give thanks to the wonderful conference committee that have put all of this together. So, and of course we have the final keynote as well. So please do come to that last summary talk and keynote. We'll also be awarding the prizes for the Oracle Cryptico Treasure Hunt and for the poster prize, the Oracle poster prize. To know what's happening today, there is the today page on the conference information system. And again, you can look at the week if you go onto the timetable as well. In terms of what we've got coming up this week, we have lots of stuff. So this morning, following this welcome session, we're going to have the presentations on continuous integration in HPC, a little bit on testing and also on a cookie cutter system, which looks really cool. And then this afternoon, we have a workshop on the RSE landscape, really sort of investigating the role diversity of RSEs. 
On Tuesday, we have our blended workshop. So this is the one with Amazon, which is open reproducible research in the cloud. This is running at various sites across the UK. And I've heard that there are people in these sites. So, you know, if you haven't had a chance yet, get in contact with James Grant and he may be able to fit you in. We'll also be having our diversity and inclusion panel, which is going to be, I think, very interesting. And there'll be some presentations as well on how hard is it to add a button, the impact of RSCs, and one I've been particularly looking forward to, the senior RSC career pathway. So what happens really after the, the entry level posts? And that should be quite a cool talk. On Wednesday, we have the RSC 2031 discussion. I'm biased. I am in it. It'll probably be the best discussion ever. And of course, we have the voice first research talk, which is going to be an interesting talk about how Alexa was connected to simulation software to then run simulations by voice. And we will, of course, be having the very last poster session. So again, your chance to have a quick look at the posters and we'll sort of present the how did all of the discussion posters go, uh, which I think will be a nice thing to wrap everything up. Thursday is then an important day. This is the day when they have the Society of Research for Engineering's annual general meeting. If you're a member of the society, please do turn up to this. I believe they need to be quiet. Lots of interesting things will be discussed. And there's the vote as well, which I assume I think we're getting our tokens this week to enable us to vote on the various amendments on who's going to be on, who's going to be a trustee. So, you know, very important. Please do sort of take part in this. And then in the afternoon, we will be having our final keynote. The final keynote is publishing software with Joss. And then, of course, the final wrap-up talk, which I've mentioned, where we're thanking everybody, awarding those final moose, the Oracle Poster Prize, Oracle Cryptico Treasure Hunt Prize, and sort of summarising the conference. And then there'll be like a final sort of networking in the conference centre on Thursday, if you want to come along and sort of say hello, goodbye to people, etc. Other things to note, well, as I said, there is the Open Data Workshop tomorrow, so there's the link on the page if you want to join that. Um, it will be running in person in Bristol, Cambridge, London, Manchester, Oxford and Sheffield, and it should be very, very cool. So again, talk to James if you wish to be part of this. Um, if you've been looking in the conference centre, be aware that there is an evil cat which has appeared, um, as well as some very strange objects, and the weather does appear to be changing if you look at the clouds. Um, and again, that's the route to solve the coins. But anyway. Uh, Thursday afternoon does have the final closing keynote plus the wrap-up talk, so please do come along to that. I think it should be a nice way to finish this whole month of celebration of research software engineering. And then feedback. I mentioned this at the beginning. So we've had the feedback open throughout the entire month. Thank you for those of you that have sent feedback. We really do appreciate the kind comments. This feedback is really important this year. Um, it's just, I think, probably 30 seconds to one minute of your time but it will enable us, because this online conference was the first time we've done this, it will enable us to really hear about, you know, what your feelings of it were, what worked, what didn't work, and also to let us plan what will be happening for RSC 22 next year. So obviously there's going to be a lot of change. I personally expect RSC 22 to be in person, but I'm not involved with organising it, nor am I a trustee, so I, I don't have any say on this. Um, but I think, you know, there are lots of things I think from this year we've learned from running things online. And so we are very keen to have your feedback. To access the feedback, it's on the conference information system. Just go on the contact and feedback details button, which is highlighted there with a the circle. That will bring you to the contact information page. And then you can see there, number three, fill in the feedback survey. And then you click on that. And then you have a very, very short feedback survey to fill in. Please do this this week. We may email everybody. We've been trying not to email people. We don't want to spam people, but this may be the one thing we do email everybody about to say, please do fill in this feedback. And then of course, if you don't want to find it on the conference information system, you can do it in Gather Town in the virtual conference center by just walking to the um, September RSC conference booth. And there you can see highlighted, we have a little sort of envelope, which is send feedback. And that's where you'll be able to do things there. So, okay, I think that's everything I wanted to cover in this sort of welcoming talk as ever. And I think, you know, people really have, it's been so nice to see how everyone's engaged with this conference. You know, even with the circuitous routes doing the treasure hunt, I've been very impressed with how people engaged with it. And I think it's, they're very cool. So I, I you know, I applaud the ingenuity with uh, many of the ways that people were finding uh, to find the coin circuitously. Um, but, you know, please do engage with it make September RSC more than some of the sessions and try and make it the best RSC conference you've attended. And so with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm just going to give us basically a one minute, uh, maybe a two minute break to then enable us to set up for the talks, which will be coming in about two minutes time.
Good morning and welcome to September RSE presentation session seven. Um, yes, we are being recorded still. Um, and we have three super talks coming up for you. Um, as usual, each talk will be 20 minutes. We then have five minutes of questions. So the Slido will, is, is already on the chat. So pop your questions into there and do remember you can upvote if you want to. Um, then between the second and the third talk, there'll be a short five minutes ish. Come for a break. So um, we've got three talks. We've got um, Mark, Melvin and Matthew for you today. So um, without any further ado, I'll pass over to the first one. Over to you, Mark. Great, thank you for the invitation to talk. I'll just share my screen. Uh, fantastic. Uh, uh, great, so um, I'm an RSC at uh, Durham University. Um, and uh, this was work done with um, Holger Schultz and um, Tobias Weinziel from uh, Computer Science at Durham as well. Um, yeah, so basically this is a talk about um, HPC and um, how CI can be used to add value to HPC codes. So um, there's obviously a lot of uh, very, very successful um, CI pipelines used throughout the software engineering world. So this isn't really a talk to say this is um, what should be used everywhere. It's rather to show um, what CI can do um, to, to how CI can do more than simply kind of validate HPC codes. So we're going to kind of present a prototype for how we can use CI to compare different machines and different architectures um, to observe code trends over time and um, automate profiling um, across a range of different clusters. Um, so firstly, um, I'm just going to present a uh, kind of very, very brief high level um, introduction to the code we work with. Um, so this is, uh, we work with a piano, which is a PDE solver framework. Um, it offers uh, dynamically adaptive uh, Cartesian meshes, and it provides a very high level of abstraction to users. So it will handle all the kind of orchestration of tasks, grid traversal, and uh, decisions on uh, where to place data and memory. So it's obviously a very high level um, overview. Um, and um, I'd point you to the literature here if you're interested to read more about it. And these are the kind of, uh, some of the outputs that it can do. Uh, it was done in the past, so it does all sorts of things from earthquake simulations to uh, cosmological um, simulation as well. So um, uh, some detail on the pipeline that we set out to implement first. So um, typically, uh, as, as usual in CI, we uh, want to run uh, we want to run our pipeline um, upon all um, code updates to our master branch. Um, and uh, in the first instance, we want to run uh, permutations of a key benchmark. So we target the Euler equations, which is, we simulate in Piano. And uh, we want to kind of, um, we want to test uh, different implementation variants. So um, different, we want to test different aspects or different behaviors within the code, uh, different, different modes that we can run in. So release, assert, and debug. And then also uh, with things like periodic boundary conditions on and off. Um, but we can, we can obviously specify lots of different parameters to our test as well. So uh, forthcoming things would um, open a lot more possibility there as well. And we want to run on uh, multiple uh, clusters simultaneously. Um, so at the moment we support um, Hamilton and Dyne. That's where our current experimentation has been. Um, but we want to kind of allow the monitoring of performance across different hardware and be able to observe trends. For example, if our, if our performance on AMD begins to deteriorate in relation to Intel, say for example, we want to be able to spot those things quickly. Um, we also plan to add uh, BEAD, which is another um, N8 supercomputer that um, um, offers us GPU support, so we can monitor that in the mix as well. Um, we also want to look for uh, performance fluctuations and be able to spot those quickly. So um, our CI pipeline uh, collects data against Git hashes, uh, Git commit hashes, and um, we, want, we have this kind of uh, simple performance monitoring algorithm at the moment that just finds uh, the previous Git uh, commit hash for which CI has collected data, we then extract some uh, time-stepping statistics from those log files and then uh, compare them across commits and then we'll uh, flag, uh, say, a, um, a, a performance degradation and also uh, suspicious increases, which might suggest that uh, something isn't quite working in our code at that point in time. And obviously, um, there are a lot more possibilities once we've implemented this, or now we've implemented this, um, to do what we might call uh, comparative uh, CI. So, where we can kind of um, compare um, obviously much more than runtime. We'd be interested in looking at kind of memory usage, all sorts of other things. And then we also want to automate the running of profilers on our code. So at the moment we've done this with um, MAQAO and um, we want to create profiles over time and store this data 
and uh, basically really track our code as it changes. We're interested in supporting uh, Liquid 2 in the future. And then the idea here is that um, we don't only want to flag when there's a problem with our code, but we also want to uh, be able to send uh, developers immediately the kind of information they need to fix those problems on the fly. So uh, yeah, so the idea is that we can use CI uh, to do more than simply highlight problems, but also um, empower developers to take the necessary actions in the future. So uh, how do we prototype this? Um, we use um, GitLab CI, GitLab Runner, and uh, um, a really nice uh, uh, Python library called Reframe. Uh, so here's a link to the Reframe docs, which you'll find uh, just for a simple Google search. These are really good docs. Uh, fundamentally, Reframe is a, a high-level Python framework for writing regression tests for HPC systems. So it really abstracts away the kind of complexity of dealing with a system config from the actual logic of the test itself. So this means it's really well suited to the kind of pipeline we want to implement, where we um, have kind of portability between different machines. We want to run the same test across different systems at the same time. So the pipeline goes a bit like this. Um, firstly, uh, well, I'll talk about how we use GitLab CI and GitLab Runners later. But um, once we're on a cluster, um, the first thing the pipeline does is it establishes which cluster it's on. So it does that by uh, querying the host name of the, uh, on the machine. So we have two pathways here um, at the moment. So we look for either if we're on uh, a cluster called Dyn or a cluster called Hamilton. And then uh, depending on that, we, um, we set up the environment, um, which is obviously all the, the system specific environment uh, details. So uh, these are things like um, the location of uh, data in home directories, the location of the reframe bin binaries, and uh, the modules that are required to run reframe in the first place. Um, then we can also um, uh, specify um, uh, a config file which Reframe needs to be able to um, uh, set up the test. So this basically contains the, the cluster specific information that Reframe needs to begin to um, instantiate slurm jobs that it can then uh, submit to the cluster for running. Um, this then gives us, um, uh, in the final step, then we have a, basically a Reframe regression test that contains the logic, it specifies the benchmark and the parameters to pass to the benchmark. And, uh, and so on, uh, timeout, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, this kind of, this is uh, what we like about this is it's easy to support many different systems at the same time. And it's particularly easy to actually add new systems because you just need a new config basically. And then uh, within Reframe, we can also automate a lot of post-processing. So we can do all the checks on uh, performance analysis. Um, we can we can check for like NANs in our in our in our output files, and um, obviously there's a lot more potential there as as, as we move forward in an iterative um, way. Uh, so yeah, so I suggest next um, I want to say a bit more about um, how this uh, how the reframe regression test actually works. So I think as I mentioned before, um, the reframe regression test is basically just a Python class, and um, we can basically parameterize this really nicely um, uh, in in reframe. Um, so we can create um, a single test and then we can parameterize that, say, um, with and without periodic boundary conditions. And in each case, Reframe instantiates this test class um, uh, with the different uh, parameters and makes a test object for each parameter set. And then um, in conjunction with the config that it, it's received, it will then um, issue tests uh, to the scheduler, uh, which is obviously normally slam. And uh, the great thing about this is then uh, your tests can run simultaneously on the cluster, so you can um, so you can be yeah you can be running um, uh, multiple tests at once. So uh, yeah, finally, um, how do we link Reframe into a CI pipeline? So um, I'm sure a lot of people have used GitLab uh, runners and so on, um, but so as, as usual, really, we run on uh, we run uh, GitLab runners perpetually um, in user mode on login nodes. And uh, we use these runners um, in conjunction with C GitLab CI. So GitLab CI triggers the pipeline on target machines via the GitLab runner. And uh, obviously this means we can naturally trigger jobs, uh, the same job on multiple machines simultaneously. So that was a key aim is that we can then compare, uh, we can compare our, our work on different machines at the same time. When it all goes well, this is kind of uh, an example of what it looks like. Um, so this is obviously the, um, uh, a screenshot from uh, GitLab CI, and um, uh, the runners have picked up our job and um, issued it on the cluster. And um, here we get the result back that um, things have been successful. So if we zoom in on this, um, you can see this is basically highlighting the name of the test. 
And uh, you see, uh, we've also um, built the, the git hash into that name of the test. And I'll come into why that's a quite useful thing. We found that quite a useful thing to do when we look at the kind of file structure that reframe creates for us. Um, other things you might see here, so it tells us we're running on Dyn, it tells us which config we're using and uh, which architecture. And um, then it gives us some very basic um, performance um, statistics, but obviously um, we can do a lot more from our logs. Um, See, so yeah, I mentioned how we um, we store everything against um, um, a git commit um, hash. So what we end up with basically is um, a file structure a bit like this, where we have our different machines as a kind of um, as a, as a kind of root in the file structure. Then we can um, have our different configs. And then within that, we have all our different tests. And within those different tests, we finally break down into our logs, our job scripts, so everything's reproducible, um, our profiler output from those runs, and um, uh, code-specific output. So um, these would be things like inputs to Paraview. Um, so we can visualize our what we what we came up with at this point in this snapshot of our code. Um, we can also do um, uh, we can also then um, so basically, um, the aim here is that this kind of structure is um, very easy to pass. So we can compare, we can compare um, uh, our, our hashes across different machines and throughout time, and we can we can quickly amass kind of diachronic data. Um, so we really further this kind of aim of uh, facilitating um, comparative um, comparative CI. So. Um, yeah, so next time, the next steps um, for our work is um, we really want to be able to uh, run this pipeline for longer. Um, it would be particularly useful in the other work we do, for example, on tasking, where we um, keep piano as a kind of static, uh, or um, we, we kind of pin piano on a single snapshot uh, part of its history. And then we run our tasking library, obviously, as it evolves over time. And then we want to be able to monitor the performance of that library. And um, this is uh, hopefully a good way to do that. Um, we want to uh, use the pipeline to inform workload destinations. So if we have a number of different options of different clusters we could be submitting to, um, this kind of workflow would allow us to decide um, where we're getting uh, results more quickly, um, where we're perhaps the wait times for the scheduler are less. And um, yeah, the next, uh, so another one, uh, another point then is that um, we need to develop the post-processing suite so there's more metadata. And this really brings us uh, me on to kind of one of the lessons from this is that um, amassing data is one thing, but then uh, rendering it insightful to develop developers is hard. So um, yeah, there's um, there's um, a lot more work that could be done on uh, post processing to uh, kind of um, break down the challenge, um, uh, to break out um, the information that's really actually useful to developers, and could inform their next steps um, in the, in in the process of uh, working on their code. There's also some thoughts I had um, from uh, Chris Edsel's um, interesting talk the other week at September RSC. Uh, where he talks about um, um, the, how uh, obviously the carbon intensity of um, the energy usage of HPC systems varies over time, depending on what's going on in the national grid. And uh, he pointed us to an API that could be used to uh, uh, kind of um, work out when in the day it's um, most, or that you can minimize the carbon intensity of your jobs. So it'd be quite interesting to integrate that with this pipeline and perhaps uh, delay your CI pipeline so that it coincides with times when the carbon intensity of that workload would be less. So that's something I'd be quite interested in adding to this. Um, but I think a, a fundamental takeaway, something um, I think um, we show with a prototype is that um, I think a CI can do more than just validate code. So um, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you run your pipeline uh, continuously, it also kind of documents how that code has evolved over time. So it can explain change over time and it can play an active role in informing subsequent development cycles. So um, I think that's uh, um, a, re a really powerful takeaway that um, we'd like to build on. So uh, yeah, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, thanks again to um, Holger and Tobias uh, for the joint effort. Uh, yeah, any questions would be very, well, very welcome indeed. Brilliant, thank you very much, Mark. Yeah, and we do have some questions. We have a few and the, oh, and they are changing in their order. So I'm gonna go through this quickly before it changes again, let's come back. Uh, okay, first question. Um, production HPC systems can be quite noisy due to, for example, the nature of the concurrent workloads. Do you have issues um, differentiating signal and noise in your benchmarking? Um, yes, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, yeah, so I think, um, do we have different, uh, perhaps could the person elaborate a bit on the question who asked it? Is that possible? Um, no, okay. 
Um, and to be honest, we haven't, I haven't looked at it much into this. Um, the main aim has been to get up, a, get a framework in place that uh, can um, run tests across different computers and uh, facilitate the offloading from uh, GitLab's uh, CI into the cluster. Um, so the work would continue there, as you say. Okay. Well, yeah, um, next question. Are there any issues with machine security if you run the GitLab runner on a supercomputer? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. <laughs> um, not that I'm aware of. Super. Oh, that's a nice easy question then. <laughs> um, next question. Do you use a dedicated system, a system user for your GitLab runner? Uh, does this scale well for large numbers of projects and can it be set up without admin support? Uh, right, yes. Um, so I think um, you, you do need some admin support to set up GitLab runners. I mean, um, you probably would um, ask your uh, system administrator if you're even allowed to put a GitLab runner on the login node. Um, that's probably a good place to start. And I think usually people are quite um, uh, quite accommodating of that. Um, uh, I guess the other thing is um, it's not always possible to uh, put, a, put a GitLab runner in the background on some clusters. So cl some clusters don't even allow you to put processes in the background on the login nodes. So then um, you need to find another way of doing that. Um, does this scale well for a large number of projects? Um, I, I imagine so. So um, there's there's not really a limit to how um, how many um, GitLab runners you can you can put into a project. Um, so the, I see another question below. Um, are the runners uh, running on the login nodes continuously? Um, they are yes, and um, uh, we've we've spoken to the system administrators, and they're happy with that. So it stands. Okay, thank you. And what about your with with the CI systems tending to be heavily reliant on containers? Um, it doesn't look like that's the case here. Um, could you explain why it's different for HPC? Sure. Um, so I, I mean, our code doesn't really use. Uh, Docker containers and it's not really containerized at the moment. Um, so um, I haven't actually tried to um, uh, impose that kind of framework on the code. Um, we tend to just um, rely on the compilers that we know works for our code and then uh, load those modules or back install them on the clusters we work with. Okay, cool. Um... For performance regressions, do you compare to a standard candle, um, a fixed problem that allows you to remove the noise? Uh, absolutely. So, uh, I mean, our main comparison is um, how, at the moment, has been how uh, previously our code has run and how that's evolving over time. So, uh, we're less interested in kind of um, in, in comparing to uh, one specific example, but observing code trends over time so that we can inform, inform kind of development, future development cycles. And okay, okay. Um, and a final question, um, a general technical question. Um, do you use a special GitLab runner, e.g. Jackamar CI from the US Exascale project? Uh, no, I think we, we just use the very standard one that um, that comes with uh, GitLab. Fine. Excellent. Well, if there are no more questions, thank you very much, Mark. That was it. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, and so now we'll move on to our second talk. So I'll hand over to Melvin um, from the German Aerospace Center. Melvin, it's all yours. Ah, I should unmute myself. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. So uh, thanks for organizing and thanks for the nice talk before. Um, so we'll actually give this talk uh, uh, together, uh, Johannes Holke and I, as we are both uh, we were both working on the software, and we'll go a bit more into the detail of uh, unit testing um, parallel um, tests uh, parallel code uh, in C plus plus on a cluster. So it's kind of below um, the level that was in the last uh, talk. So I will hand over to to Johannes, and I will take over um, after after half of the slides. Yes, so hello um, from me. I'm Johannes from the DLR. Um, okay, so we're talking about um, how we extend the Google test framework um, to work with MPI, um, the parallel MPI library. And uh, because we believe not everybody is familiar with Google test and not everybody is familiar with MPI, I give a brief introduction into both. 
So, um, so Google Test is um, a unit testing library for C or C++ codes, and uh, it offers an easy to use framework um, to write unit tests. So you can do value parameterized tests, you can type parameterized tests, you can do user-defined assertions and, and many, many more um, features with it. So if you want to write unit tests, Google Test is a great library for this. Um, so just a brief example, um, you start with a main which basically initializes Google tests and says run all tests and that's all that you have to do in your main and then you can start writing tests. So as you see here tests work with the test macro it defines a new test case and in this case just, let's just check whether our um, library computes the vector norm of the zero vector correctly to the value zero. So what we do is we compute um, our norm of the zero vector and we compare it to the value zero and we say we expect these values to be equal. So Google test provides us with these macros here that do the checking for us. Okay, so if we compile this and execute this, there are two possibilities, the test passes or the test fails. So if the test passes, uh, everything is good. We get a green screen. We see here our test is running. All right, so if the test fails, then uh, Google test will give us an error message and tell us in which line of the code our failure occurred. In this case, our norm was computed to one and not to zero, which we wanted to check against. So the test failed. So this was a small example, one test. Um, we're using it in production libraries with uh, thousands of tests, as you can see here. Um, and it's, it can also generate like many test cases for you automatically. Okay. That's Google test. Um, oh wait, yeah. <laughs> so um, we have these two types of macros. We have the expect macros and the assert macros basically. So uh, expect reports a failure, but the test will continue afterwards. Uh, and you should do this when, whenever possible so that you get um, all your error reports at once. But sometimes um, your code should not continue when, when a test fails. And then you can use the assert macros. These work like the assertions that we all know. So um, as soon as there is a failure, the test will abort. And you see there are many different versions of these for equality, for um, less than or greater equal to, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so um, brief introduction to MPI. MPI is the message passing interface and it is the standard that we use on HPC machines um, when processes need to communicate with each other. So in particular processes that do not share the same memory. Um, MPI is the backbone of many uh, HPC libraries and it's basically available on, on any cluster uh, and it's used by any um, parallel library. Um, here's a brief hello world. So we need to initialize our library and then uh, we can, for example, compute the rank. So each process in our suite gets a unique number, zero up to the number of processes, and we can print this out. So if we run this with four processes, each process writes, hello, I am process zero, one, two, three. And there is no particular order in which these processes run. They are all running simultaneously. So processes can talk to each other via special um, functions. So in this case, um, only rank zero sets some value to 42 and then triggers an MPI broadcast. So rank zero will broadcast one integer of this value to all processes. So let's see the result. Before the communication, all processes have the value zero. And after the communication, all processes have the value 42 because they talked to each other via this broadcast. So um, MPI has many different operations. It allows for point-to-point -point commutation or um, one-to-all, all-to-one operations, all-to-all -all operations, etc. cetera. Um, two things are important um, for this uh, talk, especially MPI calls can be collective, which means that all processes must call the function like we've seen in the broadcast. And MPI calls can be blocking, which means that the program only continues after the MPI operation is finished. But this includes the possibility of deadlocks. So for example, if we would have enclosed the broadcast in an if MPI rank is zero, so only rank zero triggers the broadcast, 
then all other processes wouldn't see the broadcast. Process zero would say, I want to broadcast to everybody. I want to wait until everybody gives me a uh, okay signal. So process zero will wait forever. Okay, so far on Google test and MPI, and now we want to combine these two together. So we have MPI parallelized libraries, and we want to use Google test um, to write our unit tests. However, um, Google test itself is not MPI aware. So Google test um, was not developed with the parallel context in mind. And this leads to uh, two particular problems um, that we needed to address. So um, problem one, communication after an assertion. So in this brief example, every process computes its rank, and then we make a trivial assertion, we assert whether our rank is zero. So this is a case that can happen in a parallel environment. This is a test that fails uh, on all process except process zero. And then we do some blocking MPI communication. So what will happen in this case? Well, all processes abort except rank zero. So process one will report a failure because it triggers this assertion. It sees my rank is not zero. Okay, this is a failure. But of course, this could stand for any other assertion where process one fails and process zero not. But process zero triggers the com communication and now waits forever for process one to talk to him. So we're having a deadlock situation and our tests run indefinitely. How can we solve this? We solve this by um, extending the Google test library with new macros where we add an MPI uh, behind it. So the solution from the user's point of view is just use the third EQ MPI. What does it do? A third EQ MPI will abort on all processes if any process fails the assertion. So now also process zero will report um, an abort and an assertion failure, even though on process zero, the assertion uh, would evaluate to true. And now the test fails as it should do because the test fails on some processes. Okay, here's some implementation details. On the right-hand side, you see uh, Google test itself, and they have this assertion result class. And what we added to this is marked in red. We added a global state. So um, we can have a state that is true if the assertion is true on all processes, and that is false if the assertion is not true on all processes, so if it's false on any process. And then if you have MPI enabled, we also return this identical on MPI processes value. So we return false if any process is false. So what you're essentially doing here is we're extending a, a two-state logic to a three-state logic because with these assertion results, Google test also needs to be able to like negate them and concatenate them and do some logic with it. And now we're having a third state in it uh, and as you can see here, if the assertion can now be true on all, false on all, or mixed. And if it's mixed, it always results in a failure on the test result. But not mixed results also in mixed and not in some false or true. Okay, that's the solution to problem one. Now we come to um, problem two, and I hand over to Melvin for the second part of the talk. Yeah, thanks, Johannes. So that was... Uh the first thing we stumbled upon and the first thing we implemented and then we we had some other library where the mpi processes actually did different things so in the code here you see that um, the mpi process with rank one does some assertion and all the others uh, do nothing um, so that ends up in just being uh, called on the uh, process with rank one and not on the process with rank zero so you will get a deadlock if you if you run this um, with a global assertion like with the MPI underscore before. And um, so the, the problem is if you leave out the MPI, the underscore MPI, so if it's only local, if you look at the result on process zero, um, there's, there's no problem. So it never sees any code that fails. And usually also the test result, like the XML 
file for the CI system is written on process zero. So um, you end up with, with a result that looks as if everything was fine, but in fact, there was a, 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 yeah, a good unit test that found a failure in, in your program and it just didn't get reported. I, I would say that's like kind of the worst case for a unit test framework to have, have some effort behind, behind the unit test and then not report them properly. Um, so on, uh, we, we thought we can did about, uh, do about that. And that's quite similar from the implementation um, to the case before, just that in the end of every test, um, we need to synchronize uh, the test result. So if one process fails the test, all other uh, should fail it too. And then you will, on all processes, uh, they always have like a state for which tests failed and which tests succeeded, and that will be consistent again. And you will not run into the problem that some uh, error on some process is not reported correctly. So there's there's another small third problem that's probably what what comes up first um, um, before we always print like cleaned up output. If you just run um, the normal Google test framework with MPI, even uh, with two processes, you get like the mixed up output of all MPI processes. And um, it's not clear what's what's happening there. It's of course not helpful. So um, the, the standard thing to do is uh, to uh, prevent like all the other processes to, to print output. And that's what we, we did as a default so that only the master process uh, does all the output. That's also important for the, for the XML file that goes into the CI job. And of course, there's an interface for that in Google Test, so the user can um, change how which processes and how the processes while output. That's just a same default. And then as a result, and then you now see um, uh, in the on the top, like that you still see that this, there are two processes running, but you only see the interesting output runs. That looks like uh, if you see that the test results are gathered correctly. And um, yeah, the, the XML output file would also be uh, readable by the CI and uh, that works well. There's still some further small changes in the background that we needed. Uh, for example, uh, we had the MPI initialization in the beginning. Now the uh, Google test library um, also checks that the uh, initialization was done correctly or can call the, the appropriate initialization functions. Because otherwise all MPI functions are not valid. So um, at least you can get an error if something, if something is not uh, started correctly. Um, Another uh, thing is that you don't want your unit test code uh, or the communication of the unit test code to interfere with the com communication of the code that you want to test. And the solution to that is that to use a dedicated MPI communicator. That's just like a communication object that encloses all communication and says uh, and the MPI standard uh, ensures that they should not interfere if, if you have two communicators. Um, like all calls to one communicator does not um, change anything for calls to the other communicator. There's a, there's a third thing. So there are some uh, file uh, input output functions like creating of directories um, in Google tests that are needed for some uh, things. And that's uh, quite tricky because you don't probably don't know the setup. So your, your process could run on different um, computers and then have different file systems or one on the same network file system. Or even if they run on the same computer, two processes um, don't have uh, the same view of the file system. So even from the, if from the timing, some process creates a folder, the, uh, the next or another process probably sees this only after some time. So our solution to that was that all file IO is only done on the master um, Process and that works for, for the case that we now. And 
we when we started doing this, um, yeah, we we have already seen uh, different uh, things that did not really solve this problem of parallel unit testing. So there are several other uh, repositories or Stack Overflow answers that only um, improve the output, but um, have problem one and two not fixed. So I've, I've, we've seen that in kind of production code or bigger software projects in use for, for years, where like uh, an error on, on a process that's not the master process would not get reported correctly. And so we, we want to uh, point out that you, you need to be very aware of your parallel environment um, and of the implications or constraints uh, for testing of that. And some, some thoughts on, on the possible constraints. So um, the MPI interface is built for high performance. So there is no inner hand way of detecting communication errors. That's kind of intended as it would be like a hard problem to even get to know if another process on another computer is still healthy. So that's not something that we can do within the unit test framework. Um, so if you, if you want to test your code, you need to um, run it with additional tools that wrap the MPI communication. There's a nice tool called MUST from the RWTH Aachen, and it can check for deadlocks, for example. Um, another constraint is that you cannot do death tests. Even if they are very nice, it's not just really possible in a robust way in the setup. If someone wants to discuss that, it's, I have some interesting details, but in general, it's tricky. And like the, the biggest drawback in our opinion is that in now in every unit test, at every point, you have to decide if you want to have a global assertion or a local assertion. So that makes writing the unit tests more difficult. So um, to conclude, um, if you want to use uh, Google Test with uh, MPI, we would be happy if you use inside our version or contribute to it. And we have been using that in our institute for several years and in several libraries like in Spartania Algebra and Mesh Management and even in helicopter simulation projects. And there are still some things that we, we could improve. For example, currently some um, of the strings and the error messages are lost if they are from another process because we are not communicating all to the, to the master process again. So in, in some setups, some details of the error are not, not seen. And for, for larger jobs, it would be interesting which ranks or which processes failed or how many of them. If, if you imagine you have run it on, on a cluster with a thousand processes, um, then it would be interesting if, if this only fails on one process or if it fails on all. And this information is currently not uh, shown. And there's still some missing variants or some, some missing uh, statements where, where we didn't implement the global variant. So um, thanks for, for listening and we would be happy to hear any questions. Splendid, thank you, Johannes Melvin. Um, so we have a couple of questions. Um, let's go for them in order. The first one, do you have uh, some method for parameterizing test cases over the number of MPI processes? Um, um, you can answer, Johannes. Uh, well, yes. Um, uh, I've, I've not done it myself, but I've seen it in somebody who uses our code. Um, they, more, they more or less wrote their own pre-compiler that pre-compiles um, the tests based on some macros written in the code. So it is possible. So they write in the test like a comment on test this case on, on four, six, and eight processes. And then um, it was like not compiled, but a script was compiled that then started the test case with this many MPI ranks. And we, we also have the variant of just checking um, that, that you run it. So you, you need to then run all the tests with all combinations and only run the tests that are intended for this number of processes. But yeah. Okay, cool. Um, next question. Um, are there any challenges cleaning up MPI processes that failed? So cleaning I up can comment on that. Problems. So in, in principle, you, you don't have many 
possibilities for this. So if some process gets killed, um, the, the whole, it's not clear that the whole MPI program, so they will finish or something like that. So there, there are no guarantees, at least in the, as, as far as I know. I don't know if the, if the new standard does more, with more guarantees. So if anything gets, gets killed, um, you can just wait for the, for the cluster to, to kill the complete job or, or hey, uh, hope that, that it gets like killed earlier. Um, for like dangling communication, that's also tricky. So our hope is only that you get at least the output that there was a failing test. Um, without our changes, you can get in, in the bad case that you don't even know where the first problem occurred. So we really nice cleaning up is not possible, but in most cases it works fine. Okay, excellent. Um, have you looked into, into mocking MPI um, to enable testing HPC algorithms on a small number of cores? Um, we did not, Johannes, why? No, we, we didn't either. No. So, um, but there are some, um libraries that can that you can so there's a there's a, some kind of mocking interface integrated into MPI. so you can kind of overload so, so there, there are tools and, and libraries that can um, intercept all communication but that would be like an outside tool that you could use to run the test and we, we did not work into this direction ourselves yeah i, I mean if if you're if you're asking about like the situation of um i'm testing 100 MPI processes when you only have four cores, um, then it's just as easy as starting your program with 100 MPI processes because you're not bound to the number of cores in terms of your processes. It's, it's just running slower in, in that case. Okay. Fantastic. A um, bit of feedback, really cool project. Um, I'd, I'd agree with that. I, very interesting, thank you. Um, what, what's the plan to sustain, maintain the software going forwards? We, we made it publicly uh, available on GitHub and we try to make as few changes as possible. So our, uh, for, for, some, for some of the points, it's, it's probably not fully there yet, but the idea would be at least to be able to rebase it on the newest Google test version to stay um, up to date with their version. Um, we thought about if we can integrate it into the, the standard Google test, but I uh, suppose it's more like a niche use case. Um, that's probably not interesting to everyone and still tricky to use. So we, we didn't, so we, we thought it's probably not going there. Brilliant, I don't think there are any more questions. So thank you both um, once again, very much for that um, presentation. We'll now have a, a short five minute um, Come for break and we'll be back for our final talk after that. So see you in five.
Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, right, we have, uh, thank you both uh, to um, Melvin and Johannes again who have put a note in the chat that they'll be available in Gather Town for, for any further discussions if you want to talk about what they've just talked about. Um, so now we have uh, Matthew um, from the UK AEA to talk about cookie cutters. So over to you, Matthew. Great, thanks. Um, assuming that you can hear me okay. And I will proceed. Sounds fine. Great. Uh, just go full screen there. Great. Yeah. So uh, as stated, yeah, I'm Matthew Bluto. I am uh, a research software engineer uh, at the UK Atomic Energy Authority. And today I'm going to be doing a walkthrough um, looking at the use of the tool cookie cutter uh, in research software projects and how to get up and going with that. So actually some other uh, talks at, um, or sessions rather, at September RSC have provided a nice context for this and, and sort of what I'm looking to address, which uh, in Graham Lee's talk was called The Chasm. Um, and as one of the quotes that he puts there states, the scientific community isn't applying the current solutions offered by the software engineering community for whatever reason. Um, there was lots of really interesting discussion and observations uh, sort of around this point uh, in the uh, two uh, contributions that I've linked to there in, in the slides. Um, and obviously not going to get into the details of those, but to sort of distill down the important part for the walkthrough that I'm about to do, um, I'm going with the statement that there is a basic set of empirically good software engineering practices that result in satisfactory software. And these practices don't tend to be applied broadly in research software projects. Now, again, why this is the case far outside the scope of this current demo. Um, and again, I'll refer you to those previous sessions. Two factors that I that this in particular, this session will, will sort of uh, address is firstly, just lack of awareness of, of the practices. Um, and then secondly, uh, lack of time to actually implement them. My, at least, uh, I think that part of the solution to the, addressing these, these the particular factors uh, is the tool, the utility cookie cutter. So it's a, a command line utility that creates project content uh, from project templates. And the, the templates are, are also called cookie cutters, uh, hence the name of the tool cookie cutter. The benefit of, of this tool and, and this sort of creating projects from templates is that it allows for decisions to be offloaded, uh, decisions about say project structure and, and the tool set that are used um, away from the researcher such that they can then focus on the, the actual code itself, the functionality and, and the research that they're doing with it. Now, I, I will emphasize uh, that this doesn't mean that these, these decisions are removed or, or hidden from the researcher. They, they are still all in, in the project. The configuration's all still there. Uh, rather, th the purpose of this really is to provide a, a suitable starting point for a project that we think all research software projects, um, the, the practices that really that, that, that we would like all of them to have. And then obviously subsequently those can be amended uh, or added to as, as need be. T to this end on a, on a sort of practical level, I, I came across a, a very useful um, or an existing rather uh, cookie cutter uh, for scientific Python software projects. Um, and uh, one of my colleagues uh, and I, Sanket Gadgil at uh, UKAA, we uh, took this cookie cutter and, and uh, adapted it for GitLab compatibility in addition to GitHub compatibility, which is what it had initially since we use GitLab on, on premises uh, at UKAA. I've linked to the, the cookie cutter here in, in the slides and that's, that's freely openly available for, for anyone to, to go and use. And Importantly, I also want to note that there's there's a tutorial um, associated with this as well that it, that is linked. The tutorial is linked to uh, on that repository, and this is an important part because we're you know we're not just dumping uh, a template for people to go off and use and figure out how to, how to use it. 
uh, th there is content there to walk you through the steps of, of using um, the, the template, the cookie cutter, and uh, explain why, why things are being done uh, and indeed how you can then modify and, and, and tune them to your needs. So um, really this, this demo is actually a, a sort of a complement to, to that tutorial to give a sort of live view of, of setting up uh, a, a new project uh, using cookie cutter. And so without further ado, I am going to get down to that and uh, start looking at uh, how, to, how to start a project. So just at my um, command line here, uh, system is Ubuntu 20.04. Um, and there are a few uh, sort of requirements that you need to fill in order to, to use cookie cutter. Uh, the first is Python, so just checking that your 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 system has um, Python on it. So just you know you can use dash dash version, uh, probably something above three point six or three point seven at at this point is is uh, advised. Certainly Python three at the very least, uh, not Python two. Uh, next uh, needed is pip, which is the the package manager slash installer for for Python packages. Uh, again, just just check. The, the version uh, and, and that it matches the, the system Python version, which indeed it does. Great, and then the final uh, sort of system requirement is Git for version control. And again, just check, check the version of that, that it's installed on the system. Great. So uh, next we need to get the, the, the cookie cutter utility, the, the command line utility. And we'll be using pip to do that. So just go pip install. Um, Going to explicitly pass the user flag to, to install it in, the, in uh, the user space rather than the system. I think this is the default on Debian systems anyway, but good to be explicit about it. Uh, also upgrade uh, any packages that need to be. And finally, we pass the actual name of the thing we want, which is cookie cutter. And that should go away pretty quickly uh, and install. Now, you'll notice that there are a few warnings here, uh, and import, really importantly, this last one. Um, so th the cookie cutter script, which is what we want to use, has been installed in this particular location, which is not on the path. So that means that if I try and go to type cookie cutter, uh, I will get a command not found. There are basically two ways uh, to sort of fix this. Uh, the first would be to just type python-m anytime before you use cookie cutter. Um, and so it will, we'll see, it does find it. We haven't provided the, the correct arguments, but it is finding it. Alternatively, the, the other way to solve this is to just put the, the path in which cookie cutter was installed into our path variable. Uh, and I'll be doing that just because it reduces the amount of typing that I need to do. Uh, so we go export path, um, and then we copy and paste that location where we know cookie cutter is. And of course, we append our existing path variable so we don't lose all of those paths either. Great. So now we should indeed have cookie cutter recognized, and now we're ready to start using it. I'm just going to clear the terminal here so we can have a bit of a better view. Okay, so the next step is to use cookie cutter itself. So in order to do that, um, you need to point it to a template to use for the project. And in this case, I'll be using the one that I linked to in the slides. So that's gonna be hosted on GitHub. It's under the UK AEA organization and it's called Scientific Python Cookie Cutter. Ugh. If I don't have any typos there, great. So we press enter on that. Cookie cutter goes, fetches that that uh, template from this repository, and then it starts prompting us for input. So the first part of of the prompt here, uh, this is essentially a variable name that um, throughout the template, wherever this variable comes up, it will be replaced with whatever input we we put in at this particular prompt. Uh, the in the square brackets here, this is the default value for the variable. So if we don't provide any input, this is the value that that variable will assume. And again, will be put in the template wherever this, this variable comes up. 
Great. So in terms of uh, the name associated with, with the project, I, I, I'm just going to use mine, of course, for this demo, but this could be uh, possibly your, your organization. Uh, and if you need to add more than one person, um, we I, I recommend just putting the, the primary developer here. Um, and then you can list authors in uh, a file that we will see a bit later on. Great, and then asking for an email. Um, important probably to, to make this match up uh, with the email that you have on any version control systems. Uh, I don't think it will cause any um, issues if not, but again, good, good to be try and be consistent with that. Great, and then the next thing it prompts for is the VCS domain, the version control system domain. Um, again, this, this cookie cutter has been adapted, so it works with both GitHub and GitLab uh, interfaces. Um, in my case right now, I'm going to use gitlab.com such that this is publicly available rather than, say, the on-premises, which is the, the default suggested there, our, our on-premises uh, GitLab. Great. Next is asking for your, your username. And again, I'll just put mine in. And the next part we come to is probably the, the most, I, I would say, not necessarily confusing, but, but involved part um, of, of the, the template. Um, there are a number of names. This, this is for Python in particular, Python projects. Um, quite a few names that are associated with a project that you need to specify. The first one here is um, basically the human readable version of the name, the one that will go in your readme. Etc. Um, so you can kind of it can have spaces, uh, capitalization um, matters, um, and for my case, I'm just going to go with a very simple call our project example. Next, uh, the next name that we, that we have to select for for the project is something called the package dist name or the package distribution name. Uh, this is the name that will. Uh, if you do decide to upload your pro your packet your Python package to uh, PyPI, uh, this is the name that it would have, and it's also the name that when you're pip installing the package that you would supply. Um, you'll see here that the cookie cutter actually takes the previous answer uh, and substituted it substitutes it in as the default. So um, also making sure that it is. Uh, at least valid syntactically for um, for pip and the package distribution name. So usually, I would just uh, if if your sort of project name is quite simple, the name that it provides here will probably be sufficient, and you can just press enter and get that. The next one is the the package dir name or the package directory name. Th this is the name of the actual Python package when you import it into a Python module or script. So this is when you go import uh, the name of the package that you want to import. Uh, there, there is, I think, the slight caveat here that only underscores, not dashes, are allowed, whereas dashes are allowed in the, the distribution name above. Um, and again, the cookie cutter, by default, will uh, substitute those things in for you, make sure it's valid. So again, I'm just going to accept that default. And finally, we get to the repo name, um, which is the repository name on, on your version control uh, remote. Uh, and again, going to keep that the same for this demo. A short, it then prompts you for a short description. Uh, it's good to have sort of a one line, very brief summary of what your package does for anyone who's looking to use it. Then it prompts you for the, the year in which effectively the copyright on this is, is valid. Um, given this year is 2021, I will press enter on that. And finally, the cookie cutter is going to prompt you to think about a minimum supported Python version. Um, so it's good to put thought into which minimum version of Python you, you do want to support with, with your package. Um, going back too far in, in versions can be quite a burden on your testing system. Uh, so it, it is good to sort of restrict uh, how far you go back. Uh, the template at the moment kind of allows for going as far back as 3.7. If you need to manually, or if you want to go back further, you can manually change this uh, in, in a later configuration file. 
Great. So again, I'm just going to accept that. We'll go back to 3.7. And now we're done entering input into the cookie cutter. And we'll see that if we list directories, we have an example directory there now. Uh, and we can look at what is in there, what, what the, the cookie cutter has actually generated. I'm just going to do a little tree command. So we see we get a number of uh, dot files, uh, which are effectively configuring the project. Uh, I'm not going to go into the, into the details of these, uh, some of which is covered in, in the associated tutorial. Um, also a number of text files here, restructured text is, is what tends to be used in, in Python projects uh, for, for this sort of stuff. Um, an author's file, again, this is where you can list the authors on, on this if you don't want to uh, list them all in the uh, in the cookie cutter initial entry there. Uh, how to contribute a contribution guide. Uh, also the license for the project. Importantly, uh, I think this defaults to BSD three, but again, you can uh, substitute in whatever license is required for your project. And of course, the all important README. There's then a uh, folder for documentation. Um, this again, being a Python project, is um, centered around the use of, of Sphinx, uh, and that, that's the, the sort of structure here. I'll get a bit, I'll show a bit more later about how, how, that's, uh, how that can be used. Uh, and then finally, really the, the important part is, is this directory here, which holds the source code for the package uh, and also the, the associated tests in a, in a subdirectory. Uh, I just want to point out at this point, the top level um, directory uh, is the same as, as the subdirectory here, which can get occasionally a bit confusing. Uh, again, just to remind you the differences, this is the, the repo name. Uh, and this one right here is the package directory name. So this is again, the, the, the name of the Python package itself. Great. Uh, and then a few more configuration files underneath here. Uh, again, not going into the details of those. So um, we, have uh, things generated. There's still a bit more to do to, to get um, set up with, uh, or get the pro our project set up. So I'll now change into that top level directory. Um, and there's sort of two things you wanna do right off the bat. Uh, first, I'm gonna set up a, a virtual environment in which to develop and sandbox all of the dependencies of my project. Uh, not going to go into those details there. I think there's a session devoted to that in September RSC, which you can go check out to see all the different options for you. Um, in the tutorial, we recommend using the built-in module VM, uh, which I'll be using here uh, for simplicity. And I'm going to call my virtual environment VM as well. So that should uh, go away fairly quickly and do that, create that virtual environment for me, and then I'll activate it. Uh, using the activate script. And as we can see, prepended to my prompt there. So now I know I'm in my virtual environment. Great. The next thing we want to do right away is to uh, initialize this uh, as a Git repository for, for version control. So I'll just do that quickly. That has been initialized. And then I'll add all of the content here, or almost all of the content um, with the git add command. And if I go status, then it will show me all the files that have been added. This is an important step to do before you start modifying any of these files directly, um, such that you have a sort of pristine template with which you can roll back to if you start modifying any of these configuration files and things uh, go wrong. Um, so yes, that's an important point to note. I'll then just quickly... Um, commit these things. Okay. Uh, and I'm also going to change my uh, primary branch to be called main for personal preference. Great. Um, the next thing to do to get your project uh, up and going is uh, that you need to create um, the remote part of, of it on, on whatever web interface you're using. Um, so I am going now to go to uh, gitlab.com. 
um, and create a new project for exactly that purpose. So you just press this plus, plus button up here, um, new project repository. I will zoom in a bit there. So create a blank project is, is what we want to do. And the important point to note here is to match up these names with what you entered into the cookie cutter template. So I'll be calling it example to go with the demo. Uh, and then the, again, the project slug is the same as the project or the repo name from the cookie cutter. You can add the short description as well there, skip over that for time, uh, make it public or private as you need to. And then we also want to make sure to untick the initialize repository with a readme because we already have one there. And I will create that project. And then to add this remote um, to the, our local repo, we go down and copy this line right here. And then we head back to the terminal and paste that in press enter, and then we should be able to push up uh, our local changes to the origin, um, and we want to push main. And that's all gone through. Great. OK, and there are just two more steps to get the, the project sort of fully set up. The, the first is to actually install the package that we're working on in, in our virtual environment. Um, I'll just clear here to get near the top of my terminal. So the, the first thing, uh, so we do that by doing pip install, and then we pass the dash E flag, which means that it will be editable. Uh, this is quite useful when you're, when you're developing uh, Python packages such that changes you make in the source files uh, are immediately reflected when you re-import uh, the, the package next time, uh, as opposed to having to reinstall the package anytime you make changes. And then we just pass the current directory uh, as the one that, as containing the package that we want to install. And that should go through fairly quickly. Great. Uh, then we also want to um, install what are called the developer uh, or development dependencies. So uh, I will quickly just show here, there are these two files, the requirements files, which if you're familiar with Python uh, packages, you'll, you'll have seen quite a bit. They give the dependencies um, for, the, for the package. This one right here is what the dependencies that are needed to actually use the package. Uh, with the dash dev um, appended there, that actually gives what's needed to develop the package so that there is a distinction and it's good to make that distinction between those two contexts. So I need to uh, install those development uh, dependencies in order to actually start development on it. So we'll do that. Uh, that's gonna take a little bit of time. So while I wait for that to go through, I'm gonna head back and actually just take, give you a, a very quick look um, of what the tutorial looks like. So this is the other part, the complement really to the, 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 the template that, that's been created. Um, and a little bit on the background and the philosophy of, of the tutorial. And then really where you get to the meat and potatoes is this sort of getting started part. Uh, and this is indeed sort of what I'm going through uh, right now, um, obviously with a lot more detail, um, but again, pretty much all, all the same steps that I've, I've just stepped through. Um, and then, of course, uh, there is actually quite a few other topics that which I won't be covering uh, in this demo, but are there on the tutorial um, to help get you further functioning with, with the, the new project uh, template. Okay, great. So that uh, I've got my dependencies now there. Um, so now finally, uh, this is really sort of the project set up and, and ready for development. Uh, it might seem like a bit of a process, but um, in actual fact, um, probably not, not too bad compared to usual project setup. Um, great, so 
in order to briefly showcase here sort of like some of the things that you get with this template uh, and some of the features that you get with it, I'm just going to copy over um, some Python uh, source files that I have prepared in advance. Uh, this is just, it's a very simple sort of Snell's law calculating the angle of refraction of, of light. Um, and I'm just going to put that into the example subdirectory. Um, again, I'm just going to remind you of the, um, the sort of structure of things here. So we have that top level repo example, and then I'm putting the, the source in this subdirectory right here, um, just to be mindful of that. And then I'm also going to place uh, some tests for, for that um, Python module. So it's CS yes, test examples. And I'm going to put that again under the example uh, subdirectory and under the test folder. Great. I'm going to add those now to uh, version control. Uh, this is not really the, the order you would usually do it, but this is for sort of further steps on. Uh, I, I want to add these right now. Obviously, typically, uh, you would, you know, add your source, test that it that it works, make sure that the tests run, and then then sort of add and push up to um, version control. Uh, right, so that's added. Those I will commit. Um, that's going to be called Snell's law. Great, and those two things have been added. Uh, and then I'm going to push those up so that they go to GitLab. Um, right. So the uh, as I mentioned, sort of testing is is an important part of that development cycle. Um, and uh, sort of by default, uh, you PyTest is is what has been used as the the, the testing framework here. Um, and it will should just work out of the box as long as you've written your 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 test correctly. Um, PyTest has been selected because it's a fairly low barrier to to entry. Uh, it doesn't require really that much configuration anyway. Um, and as we can see here, uh, test passing. Um, and another part of this is that we can get uh, coverage reports. And I'll just uh, clear here. So the tool coverage has been installed as part of the developer requirements as, as PyTest was. Um, and so if we go coverage run, uh, and then we want to generate a coverage report, we can do that da, 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 da. Uh, right i didn't put that's uh, i need to put pi test in there and then that should go great so we can see here that we get uh, and i need to actually configure this because it's picking up the test files but anyway um this is the obviously our, our source file which we're we're concerned with uh and we're getting a report on how many lines are covered by by the tests that we've run which is obviously useful information if we want to push that that coverage up right um so that's the testing side another important part of um sort of software projects and and one that this this templates provides is documentation uh, as i mentioned previously it's sphinx that is uh configured to be used with with this project uh, and you can get that uh, with the make command. Um, so we just specify the document uh, directory uh, and there's a make file in there that will handle everything that needs to be done for building the documentation. And then we also just specify that we want HTML uh, output for that. And that should, yep, run through fine. Um, so there, there has been now HTML uh, output generated. Uh, I'm not going to show that right now. I'm actually going to switch over uh, back to GitLab and um, showcase another part of this template, which is the, the CI pipeline um, that has uh, been set up as well uh, and actually builds this documentation. So switching back 
to our project here. I'm just going to uh, quickly load that. Great. Um, and we see that that commit I made of, of putting that Snell's law uh, source code into the project. Um, it's been reported there. And we also see this little status symbol here, uh, which tells us that there is a CI continuous integration pipeline running for it. And if I click on that, it will take me to sort of a little summary page uh, of all of the, the jobs that have been run by the CI pipeline. We see we get the, the PI test and coverage uh, jobs. So those, those commands that I executed, those are run automatically to test uh, to run the tests. Um, we also see that the, the documentation, as I've just shown, um, is, is built. And then that documentation is deployed um, using um, GitLab's built-in uh, sort of pages feature. And we can get to those pages by going to the sec section uh, the settings, uh, clicking on pages, and then clicking on this link under here. And we should be taken to the documentation for our example project. So there we go. This is obviously very bare bones at the moment. I haven't filled in anything, but it provides a nice skeleton uh, for the documentation of your project. So you see you can put in some, suggest putting in some installation instructions, uh, a little bit on usage, release history, et cetera, et cetera. And then what I find particularly useful is also there's a, an API reference that is automatically generated. Um, so Sphinx has this nice tool called Auto API, um, which goes into your source files and extracts all the doc strings and will render um, an API for that. And so we basically, if you've doc documented uh, your, your, your code well, then you kind of get this for free, which is a nice kind of reference of uh, the, the various functions and, and modules in your package. Great, so that, that is a, a sort of a whistle-stop tour of just some of the features that you, you get with this cookie cutter. There, there are uh, quite a few more, um, and I encourage you to go check out the tutorial if you want to find out more about them. Uh, and yeah, looking forward to hearing any questions that you might have now. Thanks. Brilliant, thank you very much, Matthew. Um, I'm hoping the, the audio is gonna work here. I just have the, the heavens have opened here, and it was really loud just now. Hopefully you're not gonna get too much. <laughs> I'm interference from that. Okay, so some questions. Yeah, we do have plenty of questions. Um, so if we start at the top, um, can you update a project uh, made using an old version of Cookie Cutter to a newer version, or do you have to start again from scratch? Ooh, okay, that that's a good question. Uh, so I'm assuming you mean of like an older version of the Cookie Cutter template or the actual Cookie Cutter tool itself. That's uh, there's kind of a, an important important differentiation there. Um, in terms of if a new template comes out, um, then that is sort of tricky because uh, obviously you might have some conflicts in terms of files and configuration files and things that, um, yeah, might, might cause some issues. Um, actually, I've written a bit of uh, a, sort of a bit of a guide on the... Um, the tutorial associated with with this template um, that talks about sort of importing um, yeah different versions of of your project uh, and I think it could be used to do that so to, to kind of manage any git um, conflicts so yes I, I would encourage you to go to that I can I can dig up the the link uh, if you would like. And as for the cookie cutter utility itself, uh, I haven't really thought about that, and I don't really know the details. I, you know, you'd have to go look at the sort of the change log and things that have changed with that utility to see if it would affect um, future versions. Uh, but yeah, obviously something that uh, maintainers of of a template need to keep an eye on. So yeah, thanks for thanks for highlighting that. Excellent, thank you. Um, any insight on how well this works for other languages? I mean, is there an active community supporting any of them? Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I have 
certainly come across uh, cookie cutter templates uh, for other languages. Uh, I've seen a one for C++ in particular. Um, and I, I'm certain there are others out there. If you go on GitHub and search cookie cutter, or I think GitHub has this new um, sort of topics or tags that you can search. Uh, and if you search cookie cutter, you'll get a whole slew of them for, for different things. Um, so there are definitely ones out there for, for other languages other than just Python. Um, I personally intending for our lab, you know, we, we use a lot of Fortran C++, so I, I would be hoping to sort of extend it to that. And of course we'll make that, uh, openly available. Um, and I'm not, a, I, yeah, in, in terms of community support, I'm, I'm not as, uh, up to date on that for sort of other languages. Thank you. A couple of quick, well, possibly quick technical kind of questions. Um, this example directory you've got for you, mm. you source code in, why do you call it example and not source? Is uh, that the right? There's some confusion in there, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, that is a good question. I, I, to some degree, arbitrary, I think, because yeah, most of this just gets specified in setup.py file. Uh, so it doesn't really matter what that directory is called. Um, I, I, there's, I guess, sort of a trade-off between um, clarity on, okay, this is the name of the package and therefore I'm going to call the directory that as well um, versus the confusion that might be caused by having effectively two directories with the, with the same name. Uh, so I guess in, in this case, again, I, th this, I haven't completely written this template myself. Part of the, some of these decisions were made by uh, people, uh, other collaborators out, out there. Uh, and I've kind of just stuck with, with what they had previously. So this is one of those cases. Um, but yeah, certainly open to considering whether that might uh, resolve some of the confusion. And, and the variables you put into the, the template at the start, um, are they stored anywhere in the project? Ooh, um, no. Uh, but that is actually a really good idea that, that you should sort of uh, yeah, possibly generating sort of a text file with all the values that were entered, uh, just so you know, yeah, wh what was entered. That that's that's really quite a good idea. I'm gonna I'm gonna put a note down of that. Thank you. That's a great question. Cool. cool. Is there is there documentation explaining what everything is? You know, your requirements, dev, meaning of the variables and the cookie cutter. You know, the magic. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I think this is kind of covered by the tutorial that I I pointed to briefly there. Um, it, it doesn't do everything. It kind of does as much as is needed to sort of have the project functioning and, and, and have it, you know, being usable. Um, it, it then does say, you know, if you need more details, you, you're going to have to Google and, and start looking at the, the actual documentation for some of these tools, um, because obviously it can't, it can't provide all the details on them. Okay, excellent. Does this, this handle more complex Python projects? You know, for example, those using Cython? Um, no, this, yeah, this, this is obviously a, a fairly sort of rudimentary starting point. Um, they're probably, again, I would, I, my answer would be go look on GitHub uh, and there are probably cookie cutter templates for, you know, more advanced Python projects, um, certainly, yeah. And the your VM directory, um, was, was that in the dot git ignore? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. E Eagle eyes, very, very well caught. Yes, that, that is, so that there is a, um, obviously with, with the project template is that there's a git ignore that is sort of pre-compiled and it has a few of the common virtual environment names in there. Um, so yeah, obviously if, if you want to call your VM something else, then you need to be uh, mindful of that and make sure that you add it to get ignore so you don't add that whole environment into your version control. But yeah, that's a good, a good small little technical point that uh, can can catch you up sometimes. Excellent. And do you have to put the tests into the same directory as the rest of the source? This whoever it, this is wants to put them somewhere else. Um, yeah, I, I don't don't think there's any problem with that. Uh, again, because of because it uses PyTest and PyTest is quite flexible in terms of its discovery of tests. Um, I don't think there's any problem. There might be an issue with um, possibly the documentation generation because uh, it, it's 
configure Twix sort of ignore the tests. Um, but I don't, I don't think that should cause an issue. So yeah, I, I think it should be pretty straightforward to just move, if you want to move those tests out, um, that, that should definitely be possible. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for that talk. And I'm sure, well, I'd just like to propose a vote of thanks for all four speakers today, Matthew, Johannes, Melvin, and Mark. Um, it's been very interesting. I've learned a lot. Um, thank you everybody for coming along this morning. Uh, our next session is this afternoon at two o'clock between two and four. We've got a workshop, workshop session seven, um, which is the RSE landscape, understanding role diversity across the community. So hopefully I'll see you then. So I hope, hope you have a, rest of the, a nice rest of the day and it's not as rainy as it was just here. <laughs> see you later. Ta-da. <laughs>